Okay. My guest today is a renowned oil painter, Kathleen Speranza. Kathleen is known in large part for her gorgeous floral still lifes, particularly her rose paintings, which I'm a big fan of. Welcome to the podcast, Kathleen. Hey, thanks a lot. Great to see you, Suzanne. Great to see you. Yeah, um, I, I like to start from the beginning of, of mm -hmm. an artist's education. Um, so I saw that you have an MFA from Yale, um, yep. and which has some really prestigious alums, including Chuck Close, Richard Serra, yeah. Rax Dow Dons, and Janet Fish. And I'm wondering, yeah. what was that experience like? Yeah, that was back in the Jurassic period, though. That was like <laughs> 86, 84 to 86. It, it was, there were some great things about it. There were some tough things about it, too. Um, but the great things were just being in that institution was so st stimulating and amazing. And the art collection uh, across the street, the Yale Center for British Art. Yes. Uh, and the, just the Yale Museum. They were one of the, I think, the first university in the U.S. to have a museum connected to, oh, wow. to the school. Yeah, and um, the, the architecture of the building was amazing. It's Paul Rudolph building. It was a cool, like, brutalist, minimalist thing. And then, it, it, so there was a number of great things. But the, um, and the teachers, I had some fabulous teachers. I had some really, really good teachers who are um, still with me today. You know, oh, kind fabulous. of like you have. Um, As mentors? In your head. Oh, no, they've actually passed a lot of them. But I have pictures on my wall. Oh, fantastic. So, uh, and I think, you know, for a lot of people, the people they study with become very important, um, you know, so they kind of stay with you in the back of your mind. Um, so I was very lucky to have that happen. And the, the British, uh, the Museum for British Art uh, has the best um, collection of Constable and Turner outside London. Oh, really, wow. In the whole, yeah, it, it is phenomenal. So I got to study really closely, um, physically, Turner paintings and Constable paintings, which made a huge impact on me as a young painter. Ah, uh, so it, I am picking actually, up on a theme yeah. there. Yeah, that we'll talk uh, about. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting you talked about the sublime earlier. Yeah. And yeah, there's something definitely connected there. So, um, so yeah, those were some great, some great things. That's wonderful. That. Was it a particularly yeah. realist education? Because no, you know, it was, it was painting. It was just pure, pure painting. painting. Which you know, the thing is, I don't know what goes on today. I know a lot of grad programs are just kind of a waste of time, <laughs> frankly, because, you know, if you want to study painting, you have to study with painters. Yeah. Right. If you want to yeah. be a painter. And at, at that time, it was known as the best painting program. In it, definitely. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you know, and, and they were abstract painters, representational painters. It didn't really matter. It was it was painting. Yeah. Painting was what um, everybody was concerned with. And uh, the language of painting, what how to look at great painting, your connection to the history, uh, American painting and, and European Western painting. Um, so it was, it was very much about that thing that we do, which is very, very specific. Mm -hmm. um, the, the sculpture department was kind of out there. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> sculpture, I remember walking into that building going, woo, this is out there. A lot of crazy like Like conceptual stuff? Conceptual stuff yeah, that's cool. what was happening I in the time like, period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, but that was it was sculpture. Yeah. It was a different medium. It was sort of more exotic in a way than what we were doing. But um, but it was really all about painting. Yeah. So I, I mean, it's not that way anymore. I don't know what they're doing now. I, it's the faculty that basically sculpt the education. That's interesting. So, absolutely. So who was ever is on that faculty is going to bring the flavor. You know of what's there, and uh, we had great had William Bailey, um, Andrew Forge, Jake Bertho, um, these all these they're just great painters as well as brilliant guys, um, and and you know so studying with someone who really knew how to look at painting and then communicate to you what what you were doing because as a grad student you're kind of what the mm -hmm. hell am I doing anyway right mm -hmm. it's, it's very it's it's a difficult period. Yeah. And I, I would imagine in grad school, I have an MA, um, a yeah. master's in museum studies. So I didn't get my MFA. Um, yeah. At the time, I didn't want to teach. And I said, oh, that's the only reason you yeah. get an MFA. And so I, I opted ways, not to. Yeah. In um, some ways, yeah. But uh, so I would imagine with an MFA, they expect you to be particularly developed. So were they like, was it instructive at all? Like, were they teaching? Um, yeah. Well, they, working they don't. From life at all when you were. I was working from life, from imagination, from 
looking at Turner and Constable. I mean, for the most part, what I do is represent, it's all representational work. Right. Um, but, and it's all from life, but it's also uh, sort of taken into a direction that's kind of unknown. Yeah. So in other words, when I'm working from life, um, the painting always sort of veers off in one direction or another formally. Um, and, and so I'm not necessarily a realist, realist painter. Uh, I would say more of, um, I don't know how you would classify what I do, but it's somewhere in between. I agree. I agree. And, representation. Yeah. and the paint, but the painters I study with talked about painting. What is great painting? You know, what is, what's the language? Mm -hmm. What are you trying to do? What are you, what are you, what are you trying to say? And, and I think as a young painter, you really kind of don't know what you're going to, what mm -hmm. you're trying to say. And that's the whole, that's the whole point of going to school. It's not, yeah. not, I don't think it's as much about showing how great you are. It's more like, well, what the hell am I doing anyway? And, and who am I? And, and the, the best teachers are the ones that help you. They look at your work with you and they help you figure out, look what kind of trajectory you're on. Here's what I'm seeing. Here's who you should look at for language. And, and so it's more about that. And I was really lucky to have great, brilliant people look, looking at my painting. It wasn't, made, it wasn't comfortable. Yeah. It wasn't like I felt always, oh, I'm great. Uh, not at all. <laughs> but it was great to sort of know that I was in good hands, yeah, you know, yeah. and, and I felt supported. I felt yeah. like they were in my corner. Um, you know, they were encouraging me in, in my corner. So, um, yeah, so I, I really, I lucked out. Well, I can imagine that you then parlayed that into your career when you were uh, faculty at RISD. I tried to, but, you know, and there were some things that happened at that school that were really not good. I won't go into that because it's very negative, but, mm. but I vowed I would not do any of the negative things that I, I experienced you. there. I was never going to do that to a student, not going there, okay. you know, but, but the ones, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 there's a whole list of it, but we yeah. don't go to take a negative direction. Um, yeah, I think it, the, it's interesting because, um, so I went to the Corcoran School of Art, and back I mean, when I went, I, I just think it was the time yeah. period, the 90s, it was very, yeah, yeah. everything was very conceptual, it was all about yeah. the process, which I've since yeah. learned yeah. more, like, in the beginning, I was like, what is this process, and where is this coming from, and why are they so, like, hung yeah. up on it, and, you know, yeah, yeah. came from the abstract expressionists, and having mm -hmm. having you know read more about that and understanding the whole thing with the action painting and that's where their headspace was i can get right. it now and now right. that i feel like i have more technique you know now i appreciate the conceptualism but for yeah. a long time i definitely like uh it was it's hard I, to relate to if you don't have an experience a direct experience yeah i was frustrated for a while with my education because yeah, yeah like i i felt I like i had been missing work. a lot you know, I think a lot of people who paint representationally really felt like they just didn't get this whole chunk yes. that they needed. And yeah. I think I felt that way, too. Um, I didn't really quite understand why or how I felt that way, but I, I did realize there were big chunks that were missing, yeah. which I've since, I'm 60 now. So yeah. I'm like, I'm don't look longer. it. You don't look oh, it. God, I love you. <laughs> um, you know, it's been 40, 40 years, you know, so I've kind of like filled in the education. Yeah. Everybody does that. Too. Everybody does that. That's what I, I feel like that's been my path as well. It's nobody, I don't think anybody's two or four year education can cover even a fraction, yeah. you know, of what you yeah. need to teach yourself. So it's, an on, it's a lifelong process yeah. of learning, yeah. I think. Yes, done. Most definitely. You can't, <laughs> there's no way you can get 100% of your education from one school. You have to continue. No way. Studying yeah. with other no, masters. It's not possible. Yeah, it's not possible. Yeah. But um, but RISD, yeah, you, RISD was great. Yeah, yeah. RISD well, was I, really fun. Some phenomenal artists that have graduated from there as well. So I, you know, yeah. uh, that's wonderful yeah. that you you had a part. I was really um, lucky to teach there. Yeah, I so I I came across this great little quote about you um, in the Turner Fine Art interview. <laughs> oh yeah yeah yeah. Because <laughs> I yeah, always yeah. yeah. and um, you're quoted yeah. as saying that being a painter is the way that I make sense of being in the world. And mm -hmm. I just found that so profound. Um, and I wanted to see if you would yeah. elaborate on that a little bit, because I feel like you and I are on the same wavelength yeah. there in wavelength. the sense that yeah. um, uh, I, uh, you know, I feel like as artists, we've been given this lens to view the world, but I think it's much more than that. It's much more powerful if we allow it. It's kind of almost yeah. our path to enlightenment because yes. we see sure. things and make connections that your average person doesn't see. And so yeah. I, that's what yeah. resonated with me in that statement. And yeah, I'm I think it's, it's a big, it's a big thing. It's a big question. And I think it's different for every artist, right? It's different for 
different people, making sense of the world and your place in the world. Um, you know, it's, I know for me as a kid, growing up and developing whoever I am, yeah. uh, it was everything. It was safety, it was, it was respect, it was entertainment, it was emotional satisfaction, it was intellectual satisfaction. It was like so many, uh, it was respect, it's how I got respect for the person I was. It's like mm -hmm. I could do this thing. Mm -hmm. So there were any number of combinations of experiences that went into that, right? But, but I think as an older person, you, you realize, wow, you know, uh, it becomes such a necessary part of your life and everything is kind of built around it. For me, everything has been, been built around it and for those reasons, because it was so important psychologically, you know, emotionally to, to do the work. Right. Um, but making sense of the world, I think visual people make sense of the world in, in a different way than, you know, people who are more verbal or people who are, they make music or they're writers. Um, I think for us, visual sensation is like an overwhelming, stimulating, awesome thing. So you walk through the world with this, like, with your head on a, on a swivel, you know? And, and so how do you then um, cull down the experiences you're having into something manageable that you can then translate? I, that's, how, that's how I feel. I feel sort of like I get full of all this stuff and I have to have some channel to squeeze it into so I can, so I can get it out in a, in a coherent way. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, most definitely. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And, and then, and then when I look at the paintings, I'm like, you know, oh, that's what I was thinking or that I don't really know what I'm doing really until I see the painting. Like, oh, that's, that's what I was feeling with that subject. And, mm -hmm. um, and what's even more amazing to me as a painter, which is something I hadn't even really I hadn't even really expected, to tell you the truth, is that other people can gain access to that place by looking at your paintings. That's just a That's miracle. beautiful. Isn't that a miracle? Yeah. Me, it you really know, is. Honestly, when you're doing it, you're really only in it. You're in the process of yourself. There's nobody else in the room, right? It's like you're just there with this language you're dealing with. But the fact that after the fact, somebody can look at it and they can see into some of the things that you were doing and thinking and feeling yeah, and they can feel them too i mean yeah. honest to god that's that's a miracle that's so profound we can really relate yeah. that yep. common human ex experience and whatever we're we're doing and going through yeah, you know absolutely. i i think about that a lot that you know there's a there's kind of mentors right out there for absolutely. for us and everything that happens to us literally good and bad you know, right. we, we're not the first person to walk any path right so right, you just have right. to find the people that have done it before you and you do, and you find your tribe. You find your tribe. I feel like it's, you find your audience. Because yeah. not everybody's going to be your audience, right? I mean, yeah. even, there's some people who don't like Vermeer. I mean, I, <laughs> I would want to have nothing. Who's, who's to do that person? <laughs> I don't know. Not interesting to me. But, you know, there are people who are just not going to be on your wavelength. And, and the wavelength that you're on, it's almost like a very specific channel. Um, and people who can tune into it have had similar experiences with life or with, vision uh, or with emotion, you know, just an emotional kind of state of mind. Um, when I look at great art or listen to great music, it, I feel, you feel it. It's like, yes. boom, you know, your whole body like responds to it. And so, you know, you're, it's not even conscious, it's, it's subconscious. Mm -hmm. And those people are your, that's your tribe, mm -hmm. that's your track. Mm -hmm. in art history I would say mm -hmm. you know we all have like a train that we're on you know and <laughs> this particular track I'm on like the Turner track which relates to Velasquez which relates yeah. to you know, Vermeer there's like a so anyway I yeah kinda... there's definitely a thread that's wonderful yeah. it, it feeds into um uh let, well, let, let me keep going with some of my questions here um yeah well maybe well, let's just let's uh you're, that led beautifully, I think, into my question about the sublime. So maybe we should just jump right yeah. into that because we, we've been kind of hinting at that. Um, what is the sublime? Ooh, what is the sublime? Yeah. So, it's a big um, be it, beauty, beauty in the sublime, right? Because that's really kind of the way that it was originally conceived, yeah. right? Because when I think that, of the sublime, awesome. I'm thinking transcendental, you know, I'm thinking romanticism. There's so many periods that 
sure. kind of spin off of that, you know? Exactly. And it, is it, that is that something that I think yeah. is inspiring the work, right? Your work? I, I think so. I think, you know, I think having been so, you know, profoundly influenced by Turner as a young painter, when I was like a, I was like a sponge, you yeah. know, and, and, and um, Andrew Forge, who was a really important teacher for me, um, he understood what I was doing. I didn't really understand what I was doing, but he helped me to understand that the language that Turner was pursuing, there was a common thread Ooh, with I what that. I was doing. I mean, mm -hmm. I obviously didn't paint more Turner, but it was mm -hmm. sort of like there was something happening in the paintings that was similar. And it just it will, I'll encapsulate this for you very quickly. He said, uh, Turner had a collector, an American collector, uh, and the American collector had a friend who was British, and the British guy went back to Britain and saw Turner. And Turner said to him, well, how does Mr. So-and-so like his painting? And, um, and the guy said, well, he likes it, but he thinks it's a little vague. And he said, Turner said, well, you can tell him vagueness is my specialty. <laughs> oh, and I, I thought that was that. a great story. And he, what Andrew was trying to tell me is that there's something in your work that's about this openness that's unfinished, that's unknowable, yes. that's, yes. you know, and I didn't, I didn't quite get it as a student, but the, over the time I could see what he was saying and it, it helped me see my own work, yeah. which is really the work of a painter, see what you're doing. Yeah. Um, but the sublime in general, the sense of awe, um, and it can go toward the scary and it can yes. go toward the fearful. Which I, or which I think also comes from that sense of awe, right? Because yeah. if you're thinking religion, you're thinking, you know, the God that is the, yeah. the wrath of God kind of thing. Yeah. I think that's where that, that comes yeah, from. Yeah, like you can, right? like in front of a volcano. Exactly. <laughs> um, but you're also going to feel it on a small level. And I think, I think what I'm, I think what I'm trying to do is the tiny sublime. Yes. There's, there's a term but, for it actually, because I was, I, I was researching that and the term is, um, I think it's intuitive sublime and it comes out of, comes out of landscapes. Which is another question that I have because I, I have come across yeah. your beautiful landscapes and yeah that's my background. I yeah. I was just gonna say intuitively I could see the seeds. I'm, I'm jumping all over the place, but I could oh, see yeah. the seeds of what you're doing now in the landscape. Oh no so question. There I is this direct connection it. there with the sublime and the and the yeah. landscapes and and it's well when I was a student I mean I I had a figurative under undergraduate training in the figure sculpting, drawing, painting the figure. And the figure was hugely important to me. It was very, I love the figure, I still do. Um, but it was when I got to graduate school and I encountered Andrew Forge and, and Turner and Constable and just the idea of what painting, the language of painting is, mm. um, I realized that what I had been doing with my figures, I was so confused because I couldn't, I couldn't seem to do what everyone else could do. I couldn't seem to like fully render a form and seal it up. Because it felt like I would kill it. Yeah. I don't know how else to describe it. But I felt like as soon as I start to seal the form and finish the painting, the whole thing would just flatten out and become not magic at all. Mm -hmm. And I realized, you know, I can't do it. What the hell is wrong with me that I can't do this thing? And once I started to paint landscape, I realized, wow, okay, it's the space that I love, right? Ah. It's the space between the nose and the eye. You know, yeah. it's the space between the 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 figure's background and, and its foreground. And so so the idea of space, which I was already doing, but I didn't quite understand what I was doing with it, um, came into play in a big way. So I oh, still so have that same thing where it's like, okay, so the form is really important to me and I want to get close to it. I want to understand it. I want to possess it, I think. Mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. <laughs> Ooh, I want that thing so badly, you know. <laughs> but then when you paint, you really, you can't have it. No. Like it it go it recedes when you try to grab it it just gets ahead of you and you you never quite get there and i think that's kind of what my paintings are about in a way is that i'm trying to get close completely um, and to own this thing and but yeah. i can't own it i can only make a painting of it yeah. which is like the desire to own it it's the makes. search for it right exactly. that search for that ambiguity that's just exactly. so beautiful it, it, and i can't I can't not do it. I mean, yeah. if I could, if I could make a really beautiful tight realist painting, I'd be so happy. <laughs> be so, and I, that's the kind of stuff I collect. I mean, I have in my house, I have really beautiful realist work that's uh, calm and, 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 and just focused and kind of 
and I can't do it to save my life because mm -hmm. it doesn't feel real. Yeah, that's so interesting. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying yeah. to make people feel real. And what does that mean to each artist? What is reality, right? So it's interesting because um, I love tight realism as well, but mm -hmm. tight realism can also feel almost a little fake. And I feel like what you're going for is life. You know, and that's definitely what I, at least what I'm reading in your paintings, which oh, I that's really nice to just hear. love. I mean it. And there's something so, and that, that was one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you was, you know, wondering, um, you, you know, obviously you're painting roses. So there is that kind of like in the modern term, you know, there's flowers and, you know, there's that little valley that you can get into that's a little bit too romantic, et cetera. But I love that. I love the feeling and the emotive quality that like comes right. across yeah. so loudly with your work and, and softly, you know, yeah. but it's so beautiful and it's not there in everybody's work. Like there is something really awesome happening in, in your paintings. Yeah. And you know what? I kind of, when I turned 50, I, I kind of said, I don't care what anybody thinks of my work because I had, the flowers had been on the back burner for years. Mm -hmm. They had been like creeping in. I'm like, no, 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 please. No, 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 no not flowers. That's, <laughs> I knew I was going to get hammered for it, you know, that, that I'm a serious painter. I'm a serious painter. It's, the, you know, very sexist thing, the woman thing, the flower thing, whatever. Right, right. Uh, and I turned 50, I'm like, screw it. I mean, I, I, I'm running out of time to become someone else. Yeah. <laughs> so I better, like, just feel, you know. Oh, I and, love that thought. So fine, whatever, this is what I'm doing. And then I realized, you know, it, it's, and we have a kid. Of course, I have my kid who I adore. Mm -hmm. um, when you have a kid, all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, I am really vulnerable. Mm -hmm. When you're a younger person, you don't feel vulnerable, right? Right. You have a kid and you're like, oh my God, I better stay healthy because this little guy needs me. And, yeah. and I think so that we, the kind of portal of vulnerability like opened up in a way that I had never experienced before. And it kind of dovetails with the work, but I had to be really brave about it because wow. I had to say, okay. This is what you're doing. You really, really care about it. Not a lot of people. A lot of people are going to think you're a lightweight and dismiss you. Fine. Nothing I can do about that. Well, they're not looking then. They're, eh, not. they're not looking. They're not on my wavelength. <laughs> yeah, they're not on my wavelength. I, that's the way I see it. But, oh, I totally but, agree. But, you know, it's sort of like I have these experiences all day long. It's like, oh, my God, you know, how do I? It's almost like I have to have like blinders on to channel it to something specific it's because interesting nature, that you talk about wavelength everywhere. because um they actually you know they say that roses operate on the highest wavelength i don't know if you've heard this somebody told me when i, I started like painting them somebody who's kind of more has new age um, yeah, education yeah, mentioned like that, that to me that everything has a vibration and that roses have yeah. some of the highest vibration and so i just Beautiful. i love i love that comment yeah and maybe that that's too. something that you're picking up on could be it, it the subject itself is huge and if you look through the history of art it goes all the way back to the egyptians i mean the rose as a flower and as a subject has been more important than any other botanical form in a, in art history in a lot of ways oh, and it's because wow. i'm doing all this research now because yeah. i've read every book yes. about roses and, and painting and so forth and um so there's something there and i think part of it is they're mysterious yes you can't oh. see inside them I'm right, they're yeah. like this little cup that's got its secrets tucked away on the inside, and you know, and they're also very, very specific. Oh, um, they're, I'm getting chills. Read, yeah. Oh my God, I mean, they're they're like people. They yeah. really are. I, How I, they I unfold, know. especially oh, those please. English roses that you. Oh my God, the ones, oh. the, the old ones in yeah. the garden that I shot Monosphot is just to die for. And but there's something very, very special about this particular flower, and. And it, it's nothing to do with me. It just is what it is. Mm -hmm. And people respond to them. I mean, I've been amazed that people respond to these paintings more than anything else I've ever done. And wow. so there's something in there. I'm like, okay, let's keep exploring this. Um, and I feel like I've just like scratched the surface of like potential uh, for the poetic content. That yeah. So where, where does that poetry come from? Where, what do you think? That I like what I'm reading. Where do you? What do you think it is about your work uh, that Good question. that creates that think, emotion and that poetry? I think is it's it, coming is it together the a lot of yeah, it, space is a part of it. But I think it's a lot of like things coming together that just happen to be particular to my 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 background. Yeah, right. Growing, I grew grew up in the Catholic Church, I did which too. is 
to yeah, just, you too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I am. <laughs> yeah. But everything is visual. Mm -hmm. You know, every you've got statues, you've got mm -hmm. architecture, you've got color, you've got the sta stations of the cross. Yeah, I remember like you know, it's been a lot. Of, it was a big thing when mm -hmm. I was taking church, and I remember being so bored with what that boring guy was saying up on the <laughs> altar. And it was just wow. This is some cool stuff happening here, you know. And uh, there was one particular statue that was blew my mind as a kid because I could see it. It was it, the the, pedis, the pediment the pedestal was low, mm -hmm. so it was like right on my eye level, and it was the Virgin Mary crushing a snake. Oh yeah, and it was like the snake blood shooting out of its mouth, and her toes are wrapping around it, and she's got this like serene look on her face. <laughs> You're thinking, oh, cool, you know. So part of it is imagery that yeah. comes from that background, but also in a sacred space. Yeah, that yeah. images and this idea of a sacred moment or a sacred meditative moment, uh, and then there's just the weirdness of being a hypersensitive kid, which. Uh -huh. I must have been a nightmare. I mean, I have a normal kid who's wonderful, and I was kind of been... like an empath. Is that is that what you? Oh my god, yeah. And physically, just like physical sensations mm -hmm. that things touch, and um, so that coming together with the re religious, you know, whatever uh, yeah. sublime experience, and then painting, the act of painting for me, the indirect nature of it becomes more and more and more important because it's about touch. Yes. So it's a translation really of this thing I can't possess out there, this incredible thing I want to own it and I can't. The touch issue, which is super weirdly specific to my nervous system or whatever, then the experience of having this religious thing dovetail with imagery. Mm -hmm. um, that's my theory anyway. I don't know. I totally agree. Exactly, I but I feel like if to prod you a little bit that, that like what 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 advice would you give to artists that are also pursuing like myself that are also pursuing the subject yeah. to get more emotive yeah. what what quality do you think yeah yeah does that's it that's a good question I think if you look at great paintings that you love uh, ask yourself what am I feeling here what what's the common thread like if I look at Velasquez you know Las Meninas and I feel so what am I feeling and why is it happening? Why is he translating that to me? Mm -hmm. What are the formal things that are happening? Mm -hmm. um, and I can tell you most of the most of the painters I love are colorists. So there's that, right? So if you're a colorist, that's a very specific thing. So the language of color, you realize, oh, I better pay attention to the language of color. Yeah. Because that's part of my con that's my content. That's poetry. Yeah. Well, how did Vermeer do color? Well, he really narrowed it down and it's really specific. Uh, it has to do with light. Okay, well, what's that about? Yeah. And, and so then you analyze from that point of view. So being translating the thing that you're feeling requires you to be really analytical, I think. It's not this airy fairy thing that you do. It's sort of like, wow, how am I going to, how am I going to get that across? Yeah. Because you know when you see it. Yeah. Right. And you have that moment in your painting, like, there it is. Right? Yeah. And you know when you see it, but getting there is a lot of kind of grunt work. You know, so just, how do you get there? How how yeah, do you get, you get there? there? A lot exactly. of a lot of I get there by failure. By failure? So by failure and, and, and do you write? Like is there anything that you're like, is there any part of your process, your creative process writing, that allows you this insight? Just being in the studio. Just literally time in the studio. It's it's the it's a funny thing. If you're in the studio, you're gonna make discoveries. Yeah. You're just going to. And when you and do, you write it down, right? So that you're I aware of it. I write it down. No, I, I, I make paintings about it. And then I look at the paintings, how they talk to each other. Oh, that's but it's in the experience. Like right now I'm working from, uh, actually, this is one of the ones I'm working on, this one behind me. But it's, it's the idea that these particular flowers, they have this color cord, which is like a magenta. Um, and they, this one doesn't show it yet, but they have a lushness and a weight and a kind of fertility thing that I just find fascinating. I don't even know if that's going to come through in the painting, but that's kind of where I think it's going to go. Yeah. Um, but then once you start painting, it, you don't know until you, you just find your way through. But I think if you pay attention to the painters you love and study them when you're not painting, mm. when you're not painting, I would say I spend at least, maybe a little less now, but I used to spend at least as much time looking at painting as I did actually painting. Oh, wow. This is, this is huge. Yeah. This is your language. Yeah. This is, I mean, musicians listen to music and poets read poetry. And, um, and I think 
and this is just the one of the gifts of teaching is that I've been able to admit over the years and years and years that I've been teaching, I've been able to kind of feed my own, you know, eyeballs, you know, when I'm explaining it to someone else, I'm actually also reminding myself what it is that, that I'm seeing and feeling. Oh, um, that's so that's been huge. That's been huge. I think that's been one of the reasons why I, can, I feel more in control of control is a bad word, but more in, in line with being able to translate something because yeah. I have all this analytical stuff back here that's been percolating around for. You know, and how long has it been percolating around? How long do you think it took for you to make all these connections? Uh, oh God. This is, that gives everybody and hope. Think, <laughs> oh, that's good to hear. Yeah, I'm 60. So yeah, I, I feel like I'm just getting started. Yeah, I'm, oh, I'm I love coming that. to the studio every day. I'm like, what the hell am I gonna do? I don't know, let's see, <laughs> let's see. I don't know. And it's it's always um it's always an adventure, it, and I think being awake to the adventure of it is hugely important. I, I you know I, I look at I love student work. Tell you the truth, because mm -hmm. it's really honest. It's very very honest. They make mistakes yeah. because it's honest. Yeah, it's it, the painting. I think is the worst. Is that sort of like you know Joe Pearl painting? Like okay, I do the same painting over and over again. It's like oh my god, it's so boring. It's yeah. not creative. Right. Creativity involves risk. Right. Fear. Yeah. Vulnerability. And you could fail. And and you will. You will fail. But you will learn who you are by figuring out what your failures are. Right. Well, do you try to do this thing? Like I was saying before, I tried to do this realist thing. And I'm yeah. like, please let me do it this time. And it doesn't work. That's really beautiful. And then understanding. What's that all about? Yeah. yeah. Why? Why can't you do that? Or what I is it about? Yeah, that's right. And you'll be frustrated. Follow your frustration. You know, follow, listen. Oh, that's good. Frustration because it will point you in the right direction. Yeah. Uh, and I think being an artist is really, you have to be really, it's not for wimps, man. I mean, mm -hmm. it is, <laughs> it's an everyday exercise in relaxing with vulnerability, doubt, often financial insecurity, as well as real insecurity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it's 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 a tightrope walk, but the thing is, it's always fun. It, it's 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 exciting. Yeah. Even really when it's a bad day, you know, and you leave and you're like, oh, what a bad day. But you you're glad you did it, like a bad workout or something. Yeah. <laughs> oh, bad workout. I was. Just um. Thinking, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, but but I think you have to trust yourself a lot, and you have to study the artist you love. And 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 this is something I learned way back as a, as a student. How do you look at painting? You know what. And that's the, it's a language, it's a language. Um, and it's not, one of my other teachers said, you know, um, anything can be art, but not everything can be painting. Mm. Oh, painting wow. Painting has a very specific language. Yeah. It's oh. the language. And yeah, there are people who don't believe that and whatever, we're never going to agree. I don't yeah. want to have a deal with you anyway. If you don't Those aren't painters. Hey, <laughs> not on our wavelength. And there's a lot of them. Um, <laughs> but I've learned to ignore, it, it, it's been great to learn to ignore the noise of the cacophony of art world yeah. crap because yeah. it doesn't help you. It doesn't help you. It doesn't motivate you. It doesn't help you. It just distracts you. Yeah. Pulls you out of your own focus. Your own um, lane. Yeah. Yeah. So I say just tune into what it is you absolutely love. Be in the studio because you want to discover something, right? Not because you want to be an important artist or you yeah. know, whatever the hell that means or, or make a great painting, although you kind of always want to make a great painting, don't you? But you, you want to be there because it's the experience that you love. A hundred percent agreement. Yeah. yeah. Like it's it our, it's our path to enlightenment. That's why we're here doing this. Exactly. exactly. And, and you that. know, and, and it's, there's a lot of little rocks on the road to enlightenment, I would guess. Yes. And, um, <laughs> yeah. That kind of transcendent state that you get when you kind of know you're there. Too. Yeah. Every now and then it's like, oh, wow, that that's pretty cool. Yeah. And then somebody else sees it and they tell you, wow, that's pretty cool. It's like as good as it gets. Yeah. It's when you've left that imposter syndrome behind, right? You're not worried about <laughs> what has been done before, what other people are oh, thinking. You kind of start shit. seeing yeah. seeds in your own work and and building on that. Yeah. Yeah. Imposter syndrome is all conscious stuff. It's all about being conscious. Because you don't work with your conscious, you do, but you don't really work with your conscious mind when you're painting. Ooh, ooh, ooh. that's a really good topic. Yeah. I was just thinking that because yeah. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about your process 
and mm. I know you do um, drawings because you're you're always about trying to understand that form. But at the same yeah. time, you're extremely intuitive, right? So how are you balancing that? Because I think you also yeah. work from your, uh, you know, in the classes I've taken with you, you allow the paintings to speak to you and tell you yeah. what they need and they, yeah. get, they develop over time. Right. right? right. So how is, yeah. how's that I process? Can't, I can't really help it, help it. I think it's, there are things that you can't help. <laughs> you know, like kind of born with, you know, and it's <laughs> like, okay, this is my thing that I just can't. I have to look at paint for a long time mm -hmm. because then I have a an, then I have a relationship with it, mm -hmm. right? And and so it, it, the older I get, the more it's about paying attention to what's in front of my face, this little square in front of my face, because the landscape and the and the still life and the the rose, they're the thing that gets you there. They get you to the place where you're able to then be inside this box of air color that you're trying to believe in right mm -hmm. so it's sort of you know all the experiences you have they're great but the, it has that moment when you're really looking and really entering and that's very subconscious you don't you you don't control but then when you come out which you have to of course yeah. um you come out and you look at the painting then that's when your conscious you know kind of verbal mind kicks in it's like oh what's wrong with this thing Ooh, yeah okay that isn't working this isn't working um but the intuitive part of it is in inevitable. I, I don't think anybody can do any art form without the intuitive part. And if if they're good, I think they they listen to that. Good. If they're not, they're, they're just good. copying whatever they're yes. what's in front of them or their reference or what it have is you. True. I, I see it. I, I've taught oh God, how many hundreds of people now? And I'll tell you something, I have never seen two people with the same fingerprint imprint of, mm. of touch. Oh wow. I, not even not even in the same ballpark. Wow. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of students. And I can go back, I have a little Rolodex in my head <laughs> of a lot of the paintings that my students have done. And it's like, oh, that's, that touches about this. And that touches about that. And that's what she was doing. She realized it four years later that that's what she was doing. But oh um, wow, yeah, it's like, it sounded too much up there. So <laughs> I gotta like erase some of it or down, whatever. <laughs> phone, you like erase things. Um, but yeah, but the intuitive part of it is is completely natural. I, I don't think you have to. You're gonna get there. Yeah. Whether you like it or not. Yeah. And then, there. and then you're you're not concerned. Like let's say you know I'll be honest with you. Like like so you know I lately I've been doing a lot of, I think my work is really evolving, and really? I'm and I love just letting it sit and watching it and looking yeah. at it like you're talking about yeah. and just letting go of that idea of completing x amount of paintings in a week in oh, a month etc letting them just one. yeah letting them just Ooh, tell out me out the window okay i mean i look i mean it depends why you paint right yeah. uh and i have friends who are really really good painters and they they make paintings to sell them yeah they're good paintings yeah. i mean they're not nothing bad about their paintings their impulse to make creative work is very different than mine i wish i had more of that yeah i would have a normal life you know that was more stable and <laughs> just doesn't happen for me it's it's not ever going to happen yeah. you know I, i'm like kind of okay with that now because i think i think you're working but, more from intuition because i think that's that's something you can't really push yeah, you can't force it's that risk. it's yeah. a risk you're taking a risk every single time you right risk. you might make a horrible thing but Nobody the reward dies, is this more beautiful sublime work that you're doing that's that's there's a yeah that's i think that's the reward if you were in the studio right now, I mean, there's like a lot of things that look very strange up on the wall. <laughs> I mean, I have like 10 of them up there. And you probably would look and say, what the heck is that? But I, it's like, I know that if I let it sit for a while, I'll be able to then look into it, maybe, uh, and maybe start to see something that can evolve into a subject. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't make sense. But, no, but a lot of it, it's, it's, you really just have to... It's like any other art form, right? I mean, if you're a poet, you're not, you're coming up with those lines, but you don't know how the hell they're going to manifest on the mm -hmm. page until you're right in the middle of it. And then you, then you, then you read it. Mm -hmm. So it's very much like that, any other art form. And poets, boy, they don't make money. Right, no. And that's, they feed that's the soul. Really, <laughs> it's all about, it's all about soul. It, personally, that's why I paint. I don't, I don't paint. I mean, it's great that people like my work is, so awesome <laughs> and that people want to own it is a miracle yeah. to me continually um 
but it's, it really has nothing to do with why or how I do what I do. Um, it's a compulsion to express this overwhelming stuff that comes at you every day, right? And, and, and for me, mostly it's nature. Um, it's, it's so profoundly beautiful and, mm -hmm. and important. It's so important that we, that we see ourselves in it, particularly now. The, old, the longer we go with any kind of you know, crisis with the right. environment and, and the planet, um, it's, it's, it's who we are. It's right there. Yeah. Now it's like, okay, well, slow down. Look, take a look at this thing. It's huh. right there. My kid is great at that. My son, he's amazing. He's just so zen. He'll stop and he'll look at something for like 20 minutes and he'll realize, I never saw that before. Oh he's my goodness. Not a painter, but he's just an so old soul. <laughs> totally. I learned from him. I do. I do. I really oh, do. Wow. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, and it has nothing to do with reality, like making a, making a page. I mean, it's great if you can. I feel incredibly lucky that my work just happens to dovetail it with stuff that people want to look at. Yeah. But but I don't think that's any. That's kind of kind of luck, really. Yeah. It, it's not. Um, I don't know how else to say it because there are terrific painters who don't ever sell anything. Right. But they're great, you know, and they're profound and they move you and it's important. Um, but yeah, but it's all about to me. It's about why you do what you do. Yeah. That's the only question I ask now. It's why. Why are you doing this? Oh, I love that. Yeah? And if you're doing it because you want to have make a lot of money, well, good on you. Go right. for it. That's not why I'm doing it. But might be in the wrong course. business, though, if that's what you want. Wrong business, unless you kind of, you can paint quickly. Um, yeah. No, I, I, but then again, yeah, I'm not judging anybody. People yeah. do it for different reasons, and, and I think that's fine. My reasons are not something I can really control. I, yeah. It's you know, if I could, I would, believe me, I would control, I would make a lot more like, I would be more rational and calm and kind of orderly. And but that's just not, it's just not how, how Do it you work in series? Like, are you thinking like, yeah. is there a, a theme that you're thinking uh, and emotion yeah. that you want to evoke? For sure. Easy work based For sure. On? But I do, but it's not conceptual that way. Like I'm going to do 10 paintings based on this thing. It's more like, okay, this subject is amazing. Mm -hmm. Right now I've got this uh, particular rose, which is blowing my mind and I'm figuring out the color cord, how it's put together, uh, the geometry of it. And I'm trying to do some larger paintings that have more complexity to the yeah. space. Yeah. And so I know that it's going to take me a while. It's going to take me months and months to really process this. So what happens is you end up with paintings that are a series. They start to talk to each other because you're trying to figure this thing out. Yeah. I, ooh, I'm getting the color there. Mm, that composition isn't working. Okay, what if I take that color and I put it, I amplify it here and make it into this color? Oh, that one might work. So it's like a lab. It's like a little like science experiment. And oh, I love that. Not so much a conscious, I am going to make a series. I, I think some painters do, but um, that doesn't work for me. And I have a lot that don't make it. And that's, it's a bummer. You know, what do you do with the ones that don't make it? I usually sand them down and paint yeah. over them. Yeah. Yeah. Or I ditch them on entirely, but I'm really cheap about like reusing things. So I, I and, and the thing is when you have a dead painting and you scrape it down, you all of a sudden have this little ghosty thing that has some life to it. Yes. Right. And There's that could be the yeah. reason why that happens. And, um, but that, that's a lot of my better paintings have come from, the frustration of a painting not working and I'll turn it upside down or I'll sand something off. Like, oh, yeah. that's kind of cool. That's like Isn't your it? phoenix. I can do something. Yeah, your phoenix moment. Yeah. Phoenix. Art rising from the ashes. From the dust of the paint. <laughs> <laughs> Sanding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a mysterious process. I don't think anybody really has. A, I mean, people who are really doing creative work, anybody I've ever known, has said, I'm not really in control of this 100%. So yeah. taking credit for it feels a little weird. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All you can take credit for is showing up. Mm -hmm. you're showing up and you're studying mm -hmm. what you're doing. You're showing up, you're studying, putting yourself in the place where something can happen. Um, but yeah, that that's, and it's a kind of a weird life. And I don't I don't think you can explain it, rash, this is not rational, but to rationally explain it to somebody who does a job that's like really important in the world, <laughs> like <Right. laughs> saves people from death, you know, like doctors and right, right. You know, it, it, nobody dies if we make a bad painting. Thank right, God. That's true. Um, yeah. Thank but, God. Yeah, it would be really scary. <laughs> yeah. 
that's murder. Um, tell me about your trip to England, because oh, and and what was that all about? The genesis for that, and God. how awesome well, I'm sure it was. Osborne Abbey is uh, in the UK, south of London, by about an hour and fifteen minutes. Um, and it is the probably one of the best rose gardens in the world. Um, and it was it's basically the um, repository for all as many as as Graham Thomas could amass of pre-1900 varieties. Whoa. Now, literally, I mean, I have an encyclopedia of roses in here. There are thousands, wow. thousands and thousands of hybrids, which is so cool. I mean, it's the most hybridized plant on the planet Earth, really, yeah. decorative plant. And so at any rate, he amassed this collection, which was, to I mean, thousands of bushes, more than 450 specific types. Oh, my goodness. The ones that, yeah, the ones that came before 1900 were the, all the good ones. In my opinion, yeah, some of the newer ones are great. They're they're they've got a lot of great qualities about them, but the older ones are like they're just all they do is just sit there and they're poetic. They don't have to do anything; they just sit there and then they're just <laughs> they're like poetry on a bush, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, how do I uh how do I begin to translate this thing? And there was four hundred of them, uh -huh. and I told I told my husband, I'm like, I'm like in tears here. I mean, I, and I had been in this garden once before, and I only oh. had one day. I had one day, and I'm like. I, I was scheming for years. How am I going to get back there? And I've been trying since the pandemic, of course, threw everything up in the air. But I've been trying to get back there ever since. Um, so I planned this thing because I had a teaching class in London. Oh, and fantastic. My teaching class, my class is in July. Hmm. I'll go in June. Just <laughs> it, you know? Oh, wow. So I ended up there for uh, 11 days uh, in this garden. Um, and I can't, I can't even explain how moving it was um mm -hmm. yeah i mean it, and, and and i realized I, I was talking to a friend of mine like i'm showing her my pictures and i'm like look at this thing she's like wow that's nice I'm like what do you mean it's nice it's unbelievable <laughs> and she's like you know what you see stuff i can't i'm not seeing yeah like, it's right there in front of you yeah. and then i realized you know you get involved with a subject and you are really on some deep yes yeah connective yes. thing different wavelengths yeah yeah um so imagine being in a room imagine being in Many, many garden. I mean, it was huge. This garden, uh, walls going up like I don't know, nineteen feet. How tall is a wall in this studio park? My husband's helping me. With this. <laughs> Fifteen feet. It, they were at least they were fourteen feet, thirteen feet walls. Wow. Covered, covered in climbing roses. Wow. It was like it's huge. Wow. Three different, three different sections. And then there are all these rose beds, and then there are all these other plants growing with them. And I mean, it, it was so, so next year I'm going back. I'm going back. Already. And I've actually applied to do a, um, an artist's residency. <gasps> oh, they have that. That's they fantastic. I'm not saying 100% yet, but, but what oh, I'd like God, to do please. For three who, weeks. who wouldn't get, who three wouldn't weeks. give that to you? <laughs> yeah, so I'm thinking June, I'm going to be teaching at Rosemary Brushes in May, end of May. Oh, yeah. So then, then I'll, I'll be in England, so I'll just go south for three weeks oh. and, I, and and what's even better is um i hope we're not going on too long Tell no, me no 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 this is perfect this is perfect yeah. um what's even better is i talked to the, the head gardener the person who runs the whole place and i because there were people there and I, I couldn't paint i couldn't paint with people watching me i couldn't do it i tried yeah i just can't concentrate yeah it's just impossible and everybody's there in June because that's when all the roses are up. Right. So I said, um, look, is there a way to get in here in the morning before the clouds come? They come at 10. She said, oh, yeah, we have photographers come in here at 5 a.m. And I'm like, oh, my God, that would be in this place by myself. Yeah. For like four hours before yeah. the clouds get oh, there. That's where I'm going to do Heaven. I mean, honestly, it doesn't get much better. Oh, I can't wait to see the work that comes from that. Artists and, oh, uh, yeah. So I can actually sit in front of these things and study them. What, what I had to do this time is I did drawings out there. Uh, I was like hiding inside the beds. They let me <laughs> go inside the flower beds. Right. I find of them. But I was like, oh, these people, you know, it was just draw <laughs> inside the flower beds looking. But the walls, you know, to be in front of one of those walls and have a, a larger scale painting and be able to work. So that's kind of what I'm, what I'm, what I'm moving toward. But, but this one subject, you know, um, I was really reluctant to do it, but I had a very good friend who knows my paintings really well. It's about 10 years ago. She said, just do it for a year. Just just do it. Just don't think about it. Just do it for a year. If you, at the end of it, you say, this is crazy. I'm not doing this. Fine. 
So I said, okay, I committed to it for a year. This is about roses, like starting the roses yeah. to begin with? Wow. Roses. Wow. Roses. wow. I'm like, oh, God, no, not really. <laughs> but, I, but I said, okay, fine, let's do this. Yeah. And it was just amazing to me that people responded so so intensely to them. And, and I'm like, so now I'm in this rabbit hole that yeah. <laughs> never coming out. You know? Oh, wow. And, 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 I, and I'm just at the beginning of what these things are. I mean, the color alone. I mean, I don't. I, you know, I'm pretty much feel like I hardly ever get what I'm seeing. Yeah, I was going to say, so behind you, that looks like a Gertrude Jekyll, like the color. But is that the... Oh, color? this? this oh, is in, that in your painting. Oh, in my painting. Yeah, it isn't Gertrude Jekyll. They are. Or... Okay, good. That's what I have. No, it is, it isn't <laughs> I was wondering. Jekyll. It's not. I don't oh, have that. I love that rose. Okay. No, um, this is actually similar color chord. Okay. Same type. It's called, um, it's a Bourbon rose called Queen of Bourbon. And it's a magenta, big fat thing. And it long story with that but oh, wow. that's what this one is um and that my mother had one in her garden and the thing was like monstrous so i've been trying to paint it for a couple of years wow. now i understand the color well enough i'm like okay now i've got it I think I've got yeah it. it's an intense color I think I've paint. Got it. it's really hard to yeah because it's like barbie you know yes, like yeah. barbie. <laughs> um, but this is just a, like a begin. you can see here it's yeah. like sanded down the process this painting has been mm -hmm. many failed paintings underneath yeah. it oh i sanded, love that sanded drawn on top of and now there's like this ghost of mm -hmm. space and that's kind of how a lot of the paintings happen yeah they don't happen like boom you know one two three i've made yeah. a painting. it's not like that it's yeah a little chaotic a little a lot chaotic um and then the thing just starts to and then you start composing as as you go with all these layers all these layers yeah. oh it's you so beautiful see it and you're like oh wow that wait a minute that's relating to this Oh, wait a minute, I need to look at a Bourbon rose again and do a drawing of it because that's going to fit up here. Oh. Or wait a minute, so that yeah. that's how they've been evolving. And, you know, once again, it's unpredictable and there's a lot of failure involved, a lot of, you know, kind of blind alleys you go down that you don't, you don't know how you're going to get out of them, but you, you know, whatever. Every day it's, you come, you just show up. You just, just show up, go to the studio, and just show up. Sometimes you just sit there. You look, and you're like, I have no idea what I'm going to do today. And you just, but you show up. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the most important thing about being any kind of an artist. And it's not discipline, and it's not, it's not guilt. Just right. to say something about yeah, guilt. You can't, you can't start from guilt, right? But you, what beauty horrible, can you make from that? Horrible emotion. But people yeah. get very guilty about not doing their work, and it does not motivate you mm -hmm. to get into the studio. It might get you there, yeah. but it's a terrible way to motivate. The only way to motivate yourself, in my opinion, is to think about how exciting the subject is, how exciting the process is, and that oh, you're getting kind of close. Let's go see what we can make for this today. You know, maybe you can get closer today. And um, and it's exciting. You know, it's fun. It's exciting. Even a bad day is still kind of exciting. Yeah, even um, a bad day in the studio is a wonderful. It's still or you know, honestly, any day above ground is a good day, right? So, <laughs> unless you're, yeah, there are some places I could think that wouldn't be that way, but yeah. Very few. Um, yeah. Kathleen, what about your roses? So where do you keep them? Um, uh, I have a garden, a modest garden, uh, and I have a lot growing in pots because I don't have a lot of you know space in the ground. It's mm -hmm. a small mm -hmm. garden, but I move them around. So I work, try to work from my own because that's the, I mean, they're the best. Yes. The ones that you grow yourself. Yeah. But this garden at Modest, I have a new, I have a new outlook now. Yeah. Oh, boy. I'm never going to be able to have a garden like Modest Mom. Yeah. Different. Is that a life goal, maybe? Yeah, time to do it. Yeah. Tell your so husband. I'm, yeah, I know. My long-suffering husband. <laughs> He's a good guy. By the way, I could do none of this without him. Oh, that's I'm beautiful. That right now, none of this. Yeah. I would still be painting if I didn't have my husband, but I would be in one room by myself. <laughs> no kid, no house, no, no studio. I, it would be one room and me painting. Oh, he has made my whole life really possible. Oh, that's really beautiful. Cool. I bet he'd say the same yeah. about you. <laughs> uh, I don't know. We don't know about that. But we're doing this video thing now where he's with me. Uh, we're, we're working together every day, which is kind of really fun. That's so, that's great. Okay? Yeah. yeah. OK. Um, but anyway, yeah, I mean, if you have to have support, you got to have somebody supporting you. Either that or you have just have to be alone. And yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, we we have that in common. Um, yeah, I have a very supportive husband, and I have an only child, a son. 
16. So we have we have a lot in common there as well. So you know, I they're completely my supports. I, I do I do relate to that 100. percent So lucky. You're yeah. so lucky. I, I tell myself how lucky I am every day. You know that um, that I can do this work. And there's there's things I'd love to have. You know, I'd love to be in a more beautiful place, uh, a house that is in a in a country. I love a right. good garden. But essentially, the most important thing is covered. Yes, your your you needs know? are met. And, yeah, and, yeah, and 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 you know, and I I I did the right thing, and I married the right guy. Oh, that's so beautiful. <laughs> Just a lot of frogs first. <laughs> yes, but, yeah. here too. <laughs> yeah. so. um, I because I have you on uh, on on. I just need to really quickly ask the Madame Hardy. Madame rose. Hardy, Ooh. you you rec you recommended that to me, and I love yeah. that rose. But I can yeah. only get it to bloom once for me in a season. Does it do that with yeah, you too? It only blooms once. Oh, okay. So it's not me. <laughs> not you. You're doing everything right. Okay, good. A lot of the old roses, Madame Hardy included. The, um, uh, I think that is. Uh, I forget what breed that is, the mask, I think. Anyway, but a lot of the older roses only bloom once. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. We're, we're spoiled with this idea of yes, the repeat tone, blooming I guess, throughout the season. Word yeah. for it. Yeah, that, that that was bred into a lot of the, the, the roses that happened post-1900. because, And that's why the old ones died out. Because people are like, well, why have a rose that doesn't bloom all summer? Yeah, you know? yeah. And, but there's, they're not even, they're not the same. Okay. These are, these are. There is no substitute for Madame. Hardy. Yeah, I completely agree. There's no I mean, it that is, quatrefoil that right is that the shape? Oh, oh, it's just oh to die. For. Just to I die. Have, for. I have one on tap. I, I did get some good good images from Otis Funk of Madame Hardy, and uh, this, that rose is like an it's like angelic. Yeah, it has an angelic presence. You know, some roses are like heavy and like sexy and yeah, they're like beautiful women. You know, like yeah, buxom women or something. Right. And some of them are just like. Fairies are like angels, and that yeah. one is angelic. And Completely. Oh, yeah. Such and a I got beautiful. I'm so glad you, you told me that because I was like beating myself up because oh, I so like it has all this, it's coming up with more foliage, but there's no yes. buds in it whatsoever. And I'm like, that's the yeah. second year it's done that. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I have a new one this year and it hasn't bloomed at all because I got it new. Yeah. It's an old root rose. Yeah. So it's grown, it's grown up and it has nice canes and nice leaves, but it didn't bloom at all this year and I didn't expect it to. Yeah. Okay. Make the roots first, and then yeah. I think my like Madame Hardy did that as well. Year, the third year is the one year. One third thing. year, yeah. So you got to be patient. Are that. you are you um, spraying them? Do you spray uh, your roses? No, or? no. I I, I try oh, not to as well. I do, though, is early in the morning in the spring when they have aphids. Mm -hmm. you know, aphids are a nightmare. Yeah, but but you, you know what? They'll still live. Yeah, they'll, yeah. they'll be okay. Um, I use uh, an organic spray in the morning. Uh, in the spring, because that's when you see the aphids, and yep. I go out there on patrol and then <laughs> all the aphids. Um, but I, you know, you're going to have black spot. You're right. going to have aphids. Right. You're gonna, yeah. You know, the idea that you have this pristine, perfect garden, and and modest font wasn't like that. They they didn't they didn't even deadhead the roses. Yeah. Oh, there were like dead ones all over the place. It was beautiful because um, the rose hips were forming, mm -hmm. and the life cycle was really apparent. You know, and and there was black spot. Who cares? You know, it's just. It was more of a kind of idea that you're not manicuring everything. That you're you're allowing, you're having an interaction with it. You don't want them to look terrible, but you you got to let go a little bit of control. It's similar to painting, maybe. You know, yeah. real gardeners probably know that. Like real serious gardeners, and it's a creative act, right? Yeah, yeah. You're really in control of nature. Yeah. Sure. No, I, I think that's a beautiful um, thing to remember because you yeah, know, I, I have friends that have gorgeous rose gardens, but they they do that. Uh, they do that um it's not spraying but it's like they poison the plant basically itself so that Ooh, the blossoms that was horrific i know i know and then like i'm i'm into native plants and pollinators and i just can't i just can't do that you know, so i'd rather take all the aphids and oh yeah the crush them with my fingers yeah. <laughs> to get kind of too, too detailed yeah. there um, um but it works is there's there's a couple of sprays that are they're like an insecticidal soap yeah oh. basically soap a doctor what the heck is it sam I'll email you later. Okay, I would love that. Thank you. But yeah, it's it's basically organic stuff that you. But you just have to kind of do it every morning. You know? Yeah. It's not like you do it once and it's gone. That's um, amazing. But well, yeah, I, I have, I have one more question because I know I've kept you a while. But um, <laughs> any rose drawing tips that you want to give? Drawing. Or rose drawing. Yes. Now that we've talked slow, about rose care. Slow, 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 
slow, slow, slow. Slow down. They, they, they are very complicated forms. Mm -hmm. um, no way to do it fast, as far as I can see. Um, and it's fun because you get to know how the thing is built. It's a little piece of architecture, and doing drawing is, is so much less fraught in a way than painting because sometimes you don't even show them to anybody. It's just a sketchbook or whatever. Um, but that's that's how you get to know your subject mm. is by drawing it. And mm. and the painting, painting and drawing are like this. You don't yeah. you can't pull them apart really. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, my phone is going off. It's my sister, I think. Oh no, we're we're coming to an the end. So. Chat doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> But at any rate, yeah, drawing is completely essential. And, and I, you know, I always want, I'm going to try to do a workshop that's only drawing because it's, it's not the sexiest thing for a lot yeah. of people, but it is, it's huge. It's, it's half the, it's half the work. Well, share with us about your teaching so that people can, yeah. can find yeah. you. Where so are you I have, Yeah. So, um, so I, I did workshops for a long time, live ones. And then of course, pandemic happened. So we, we decided we were going to do some video stuff, so we did a video series. Um, and you can find all the teaching stuff I do. Um, what is it, Park? It's Kath Kathleen Speranza dot podia p o d i a okay dot com. Uh, yeah, if you just Google my names, that will probably come up too. Uh, on Instagram, I have a link to it. My Instagram uh, Speranza Fine Art. Go on Instagram, you see that link. Uh, it's also on my website. The link. Um, so the teaching, I have a lot of classes now. We've been doing it for two years. Wow. Two years. More than two years. Yeah. yeah. So we have that, done these classes that are four, like four sessions long. So like four, four uh, days in, in January, we did a class. Four days in February, we did a class. So, and they're recorded. They're fully recorded. Um, so, and people own them forever. You buy it. You can watch it whenever, however long you want. And, um, but they're done live. So I have one coming up on landscape, which is coming up September 5th, I think. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, but I'm doing one right now. I'm in the middle of one right now. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a rose painting. It's a rose painting 2.0. Oh, so fantastic. It's more advanced, a little bit harder for the people who want to be challenged a little bit, but on the well, They are fantastic class. classes. I've taken them myself. Yay, I, I've signed you. up for several, so. That makes me happy. Oh, oh you make me happy. Thank Kathleen, oh. thank you so much for spending time with me today. And My pleasure. And yeah, fabulous. Go on and on and on. We got to get a beer sometime. And Almost just, definitely. And yeah. I would love, like, you know, to Virtual come to, to the studio maybe when I'm in the, yeah, the, the Boston area. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks for asking me. It's great to, that somebody's interested in what I have to say. <laughs> oh, I just, I love your work and, and I've been wanting to, I've been so. wanting to have this conversation for a while. So thank you so much for spending time with me. My pleasure. Have fun. Enjoy your Madam Hardy. Thank you. I will. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. You have a great day. You too. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.